hey, nice to see you again. So today we're going to talk a little bit about episode two, season eight of Game of Thrones. As far as episodes go of Game of Thrones, this was as close to heartwarming and John Hughes as you could possibly get. You've got the entire crew sitting around the campfire for much of the episode, chatting like the Westeros version of The Breakfast Club. Essentially, you have a bunch of characters who either haven't seen each other in years and have no idea exactly what that character's story arc is and how they've developed and how they've grown to this point. And then they reconnect with them and find out, wow, we could have been friends all this time. We have so much more in common than we thought we did. Like, basically, because they're all gonna die. Suddenly, that douchebag principal from The Breakfast Club doesn't appear nearly as intimidating when you stack him up against a guy like the Night King. In keeping with the John Hughes theme, you also have Brienne of Tarth getting knighted by Jamie Lannister. For me, this moment for Brienne was the equivalent of Molly Ringwald's Andy getting her prom date in Pretty in Pink. It oddly parallels that movie. When you look at it, you have Brienne of Tarth, who is the plucky, likable, incredibly earnest heroine that you are rooting for. And then you have Tormund, drinker of giant's milk, who would, quote, knight Brienne ten times over. I'm sure there was a double entendre in there, knowing that it's Tormund, who's friggin' awesome. Anyway, he's kind of like uh, the Game of Thrones version of Ducky, who's best friends with Andy, kind of relegated to the friend zone, but he's that really quirky guy that you root for to get with the heroine in the end. And finally, you have Jamie Lannister, who is the equivalent of Blaine, the preppy guy who you think is a douchebag at first, but is actually really kind of nice once you get to know him. So that entire scene was beautiful, just seeing Brienne so happy and finally attaining something that she'd wanted to for years. Breaking through the glass ceiling, becoming a knight, and having it recognized that she's somebody who has conducted herself throughout the entire series with honor. Probably more so than anybody else barring Ned Stark. Speaking of Ned Stark, there was a nice little shout out to Ned uh, in the form of both halves of his sword ice being reunited in that scene. Jamie Lannister had half of it, which was the sword that he knighted Brienne with, and Brienne herself also had the other half of that sword too. So it was a really nice way of circling it back to Ned Stark, in a sense, coming home to Winterfell and honor being restored. Beyond that heartwarming scene, you have everybody getting together, chatting, talking about stuff. Everyone is pretty much relegated to the fact that we're all going to die, or there's a good chance that we're all going to kick the bucket, so we may as well enjoy one last night of camaraderie, stories, songs, and drinking. The only exception being Arya, who decides that tonight's the night that she's going to get laid. So it really was kind of like prom night in Westeros. So Arya winds up having sex with Gendry, losing her virginity, and the look that she gives at the end of that scene... Um, which was really uncomfortable to watch because you watched Arya from the time she was a kid and she still looks like she's 12, dude. It was kind of like, oh man, it's like walking in on your kid's sister. It was just weird. But the scene that she gives at the end, she finds out that Gendry actually is a Baratheon, even though he's a bastard Baratheon. You don't know what that look is where she's staring into the camera like this, thinking intently in a post-coital situation. Is she thinking, eh, not all it was cracked up to be? Um, well, probably gonna die. Or is she thinking, damn, I just boned the son of the guy who got my dad into all of this shit and kicked off everything. Now, what that means for Arya and Gendry's relationship moving forward, if everybody actually survives, how she feels about having boned a Baratheon, that remains to be seen. So that finally puts us in the Targaryen end of the pool for this episode. John went and told Daenerys that they are in fact related. He is a Targaryen by birth. He is the son of her brother and Lyanna Stark. And Daenerys' only reaction to this is, you have a higher claim to the throne than me because you are the male heir of the Targaryens. Not, oh shit, I just had sex with my nephew. A lot. Nope. Didn't even cross her mind. This bitch is focused on the friggin' throne and is basically a pube away from becoming the Mad Queen herself. But enough of the warm and fuzziness of this episode. Let's talk about some theories for next week's episode. We have had two 
beautiful weeks without deaths on Game of Thrones, which is a rarity. So that means that episode three and probably episode four are going to be a bloodbath. And with that in mind, that means you can count on probably at least four deaths. Uh, I do not have any idea who those four deaths will be. Things kind of seem to be up in the air, especially if you're looking at the internet this week and see some of the theories that are being kicked around. One of the biggest theories going around this week, and one of the most surprising, this is a shout out to Mashable, uh, where I first read this article, is that the Night King actually isn't coming to Winterfell. His generals are advancing on Winterfell, no doubt, but supposedly the Night King himself is en route to King's Landing. So while Cersei pulled a fast one and wasn't joining up, kicking over the Golden Company troops to the folks over at Winterfell, Surprise, bitch! Uh, if this theory actually is true, the Night King's coming and he's bringing his dragon and you're kind of fucked. However, even though they might not be as safe as if they built up their numbers and combined the Golden Company forces and the forces at King's Landing with those over in Winterfell, they do have a secret weapon, and that secret weapon is Freakboy Quiburn. Everybody's kind of looked at Quiburn as, you know, kind of like that creepy uncle that, that, that hangs out in your house and you really don't know why. Uh, he might have an ankle bracelet. But Quiburn is actually an incredibly intelligent guy. He's, a, he's curious. He's a curious-minded gentleman. A uh, freak boy, no less, who really likes tinkering around with the dead and the undead, but a curious man of science, nonetheless. So Quiburn has done more than just be... Cersei's hand. He's, one, reanimated the mountain, uh, brought him back from the dead into being this creepy Sir Robert Strong dude. He's also the mind behind the ballistas that they have there, the giant big-ass crossbows, uh, the one that Bronn used to almost take out one of Daenerys' dragons last season. And third, you have Quiburn looking at the zombie White Walker disembodied hand of this creature that the delegation from the North brought with them on their diplomatic mission to try and recruit Cersei and her, her King's Landing crew. Quiburn is looking at this hand and just pondering it just with this perverse glee in his eyes that like, oh, the things I could do with this. So you've got this dude who has for years been bordering on necromancy, uh, reanimating the dead, reanimating the mountain, What's to say that this guy, you know, obviously he was kicked out of the Order of Maesters for behavior unbecoming. Um, I don't know, maybe he was playing Alice Cooper's Cold Ethel and I Love the Dead on repeat. I don't know. Probably some other reasons why he was booted out of the Order. But this guy really has a yen for this, this science behind bringing back the dead. And my theory is that he is trying to reverse engineer what reanimates the dead, what can make reanimated corpses die permanently. So Freakboy Quiburn might be the ace in the hole here and know how to decimate the entire army, even if they're not able to take out the Night King. So those are my theories in advance of episode three. Uh, let's see where this goes. Let's see how many people are still standing by the end of this hour and 22 minute episode. But regardless, it should be pretty interesting. If you have any theories, Please comment below. I'd love to hear what you're thinking. Anyway, talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.